Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's make a start. Uh, a, a, a couple of um, prefatory remarks. Uh, I'm Keith Webster, Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon. My colleague Ewan Cochran is from Yale University. We're going to do a, a double act. Uh, it falls to me as a Scot to be the thing standing between you and a drink, so we'll try and <laughs> stick to time. It also falls to me as a Scot from the east side of the country to have a voice that tends to drop. So if at the back of the room you can't hear me, please move forward or wave and I'll try to speak up, but I'll do my best. Uh, we're going to speak about software curation in three sections. I'm going to give an overview of why we and our institutions believe this is an important activity in which to invest. Ewan is then going to talk about the software curation as a service venture that he is leading at Yale. I'm going to talk about the Olive project at Carnegie Mellon, and then, time permitting, we'll have a, a conversation, try and answer any questions. I'm not a technical wizard in the context of the Olive project. Our computer scientists are the wizards. Um, so I've canned a presentation from one of my colleagues. Uh, so please bear that in mind when your questions become unduly technical. So let's get the show on the road and talk about the, the impetus behind software curation. Those of us in libraries have a long history of success to a greater or lesser extent in archiving static content. And in recent years, of course, the question then turns to executable content. Uh, those of my generation certainly probably think about executable content as being the games with which we've grown up and a yearning from time to time to be able to go back and play Duke Nukem as though it was 1992 all over again. And that remains an interesting case study, use study of software curation. But I think in today's institutional environment, there are many application-specific drivers behind the notion of software curation. I take as a starting point in this the momentum that we're seeing towards open science. And my reckoning is that when I've got three books sitting on my desk, or at least on my laptop, about open science, there's enough momentum behind it to suggest that the open science movement deserves our attention. And certainly when the New York Times and The Guardian start writing about open science, it really is time to take note. The software execution aspect of this becomes, I think, quite important when we look at issues around, for example, scientific reproducibility. We've seen a lot of interest picking up in the more popular side of the media about our ability to reproduce the results generated in the scientific laboratory to demonstrate either that good science was followed or that the conclusions arrived at by the researchers can indeed be supported by the data behind that. We had a last minute move from Keynote into PowerPoint, and those of you who use Keynote will sympathize with me that my animation here doesn't work. What I was hoping to demonstrate was the shareable knowledge um, circle growing in size to reflect the open scientific movement as demonstrating an environment in which the amount of knowledge that is shareable globally grows to become a larger percentage of the useful knowledge that is out there. We in libraries have spent the past 20 years converting material to digital form. We've established standards and protocols for preservation and accessibility. My first digital project of this sort was the Gertrude Bell Archive, which was one of the first JISC-funded projects in the UK. We started that more than 20 years ago, um, converting manuscripts and photographs in the library in which I then worked into a very elegant mid-90s digital archive, and we built it, and whilst there was a lot of interest in the technical approach behind it, frankly, for the next couple of decades, nobody really came to it, and I think it was largely forgotten, except by those of us who returned sentimentally to look at how we did things in those days. A couple of years ago, a book about Gertrude Bell came out with a photograph from that archive on the cover. Those of you interested in the history of the age might like to know that on the camels, on the far left, as I look at the screen, is Winston Churchill, then Gertrude Bell, then Lawrence of Arabia, and a couple of functionaries sitting next to them. And indeed, the back of the cover 
um, acknowledges the archive as the source of that cover image, which in itself was nice, and it created a bit of a buzz. This year it became even more interesting when Nicole Kidman starred as Gertrude Bell in the film of the book, and all of a sudden that digital project from 20 years ago became a very hot topic. And I think this is the issue in part that we face with executable content. Software generated 20 years ago may languish and then, for some reason, completely unpredictably becomes um, of interest. And we need to work out how we can make that accessible. In addition to converting analog media to digital, in libraries we've got a track record of curating born digital content and we see at least some libraries picking up the challenge of managing social media products such as tweets and web pages, in this case in the British Library. We see the policy drivers behind um, data management. OECD has been championing this for some time and increasingly the federal funding agencies around the world are putting in place data management mandates in this case, the NSF one that came out last month. Another swathe of driver behind this, the movement around citizen science that has picked up a lot of traction, plus in this case talking about the volume of crowdsourced data being generated by citizen scientists. Inside the academy, we see increasingly journals, in this case PLOS One, providing access to data sets. Um, in this case, the data is stored in Figshare. When you download the data and try to look at it, it opens up in a Word document. How sure can we be that the Word document will still be accessible in 20 years' time, even though the file hopefully will still be available in Figshare or in Figshare's successor or in the Internet Archive? We know that data comes in many shapes and sizes and increasingly being provided through mega archives like Figshare, Research Data Australia, the UK Data Archive. So lots of data out there. How can we be sure that we will be able to access those data sets and open them in years to come? An interesting case study to bear this out, um, the Reinhardt and Rogoff um, economic paper, which came out, I think, in 2010, and inspired many governments to implement austerity measures. About a year after that paper came out, a grad student and his supervisors realized that there had been an error in the Excel spreadsheet, which actually rendered the um, whole study somewhat um, redundant. Um, that was fine because the Excel spreadsheet was still accessible it was only a year after it had been created. If people were going back 20 years in history, would they be able to open up that Excel spreadsheet and show that there was an error that had, if you believe the Bloomberg hype, changed the course of history? So that is the, the, the problem statement, in a sense. Inside the academy, in the context of reproducible science, the drive towards data management, we need certainty that we can gain access to the data sets into the future. Another element, um, which I, I don't have a slide for, the increasing number of journals like Software X from Elsevier plus Computational Biology, I, I do have a slide at the end, um, which are encouraging computer scientists in particular to deposit their software in journal archives. And again, that same problem statement. In 20 years' time, with contemporary hardware, will we be able to execute software created 20 years earlier? And can we plan ahead to ensure that executable content remains accessible? So that is the, the problem statement. I'm going to hand over to Ewan, who will talk about the Yale approach to handling that. And then I'll come back to say a few words about Olive. Thanks, Keith. Um, so I'm Ewan Cochran. I'm the Digital Preservation Manager at Yale University Library. Um, I'm going to give a little bit more background before I start talking about what we're actually doing um, at Yale. I think one of the, um, the most important reasons why I see um, software curation as important, which um, Keith hasn't really covered in detail yet, is um, for software dependent content. I mean, he did talk about research data and that's a very good example of that. Um, this slide here is just an uh, 
it, a graph showing um, the different usage of uh, operating systems over the last 13 years or, or so. And what it shows really is just that there was a lot of change. Um, so if you had any software or if you had some content that required some software that relied on one of those operating systems, um, you're going to be in a bit of trouble now um, because it's probably already um, obsolete from a, an access perspective, from a, a regular use perspective. And that's important because um, old software is often required to authentically render old content to get access to the information in the same form or the same information that was available um, when the original software was in regular use. This is an example from uh, the Forestry Research Institute of New Zealand. It's a research paper um, that they published that um, covers tree growth over time. The original on the left is um, WordPerfect running in Windows 95, and the one on the right is um, the same piece of the same file opened in LibreOffice in um, Windows Vista. That was when this was done. Um, here's another example. I really like this example because a um, little technical detail about it. Um, what you're seeing on the left is um, again something from the Forestry Research Institute. It shows it's also about tree growth. It's a bit earlier. It's done in WordStar, and it has some equations in it. And the interesting thing about this is the, the, the author of the, of the paper, they used um, the, the line above to do the exponents in the equation. Um, so, you know, squared, cubed, what, what have you. Um, and that's not a feature of the, the format or of the software. It's not like they turned on um, bold on the, on the text. So you can't go through and programmatically look for this um, without having some sort of really artificial intelligence type um, approach to it. So what it means is you can't really automate migrating these things between um, different pieces of software and different file formats because you can't look to know what you're doing and confirm that it has actually been preserved um, over time. Because what you see in the, uh, in the modern software is that the equation changes because the formatting, the size, even the font um, size can, can make a difference to that. Um, so what I'm getting at really is uh, there's a really great need to um, preserve um, or, and curate software in order to maintain access to software dependent content. In order to do that, that means we need to curate and preserve operating systems, software applications, all the fonts, scripts, and other dependencies, um, and plugins that um, are needed to support access to that content. Um, and in addition to all of that, there are another couple of areas that um, I think are really important when it comes to software curation, and that's um, maintaining access to whole desktop environments. Because there will sometimes be content that requires a very specific setup of software um, to be able to be accessed. Um, an example we've seen is um, famous users' desktops. Where Emory University took a snapshot of Simon Rushdie's desktop and, and provided access to that via emulation. Um, I think there ought to be a lot more of that going on. We're doing a little bit of it at Yale. The Manuscripts and Archives Unit and the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscripts Library are taking authors' um, desktops and taking a snapshot of them. Um, they're doing a bit of redaction um, because the authors often don't want people seeing every single file on there, but they, they keep the original for the most part um, and only provide access to a redacted version. But um, well, there could be a lot more of this. There's an area that I'd love to see some work in is um, in capturing desktops of developers, famous software developers. Um, we're really missing access to the, uh, the basically the tools of today, the tools that are used to build this digital world, and no one seems to be going out and capturing them. And I'd love to see that happening. Um, and then we also need to curate the pre-configured disk images with sets of software installed on them. Um, so when you're doing emulation, you need to um, set up a virtual hard drive, install software on it, um, and then use that to access content. Um, those disk images aren't really being uh, systematically um, configured and preserved and curated over time. Um, so the software curation thing, how do we go about doing it? Um, well, the main thing that we use really is emulation or virtualization. Uh, and emulation, to give it a bit of a definition, it's when you use um, a, a new computer. On a new computer, you create in you create in software the hardware of an old computer, and then you run the old software that was compatible with that old hardware um, on that emulated uh, version of the hardware. Um, and usually, the computer you're doing the emulation on has completely different hardware to the one that you're emulating. Or, or quite different hardware, at least. Um, and many emulators were originally developed to, to run video games. There, there were um, a lot of homebrew groups that got together and built things like um, Nintendo emulators so they could play their video games. There's a lot of passion that went into these, and still does. Um, but it's also been used uh, a lot in industrial settings and in scientific settings. Um, if you've got a piece of hardware uh, that you need to keep running for a long period of time, and it relies on some software, 
uh, and then your, the hardware that the software is running on dies, and what are you going to do? Often the easiest thing to do is emulate that hardware that the software is running on, connect the, the big machines that you've got connected to that, to that new hardware that's um, running the emulated version of the old hardware and, um, and keep it going. Um, another area where emulation is used a lot is um, in mobile phone application development. Basically, if you're building something for um, an Android device like this, these normally run on completely different hardware to your um, PC. And you want to do your development on your PC because it's much faster and it's easier, you've got big screens to develop on and so on. Um, so the actual software development kits that are provided to build the, um, the software for your phones come with emulators. Uh, the Android development kit comes with QEMU, which is one of the emulators we'll both be talking about in a while. Um, and one other point I thought it would be useful to make in the way of background is the difference between virtualization and emulation. So virtualization is basically the same as emulation, except it's doing it on, um, it's doing the, the, the creation of the, the hardware and software on hardware that is compatible. And it's generally used to be able to run multiple instances of an operating system on the same, on a single set of hardware. So you might have a a, um, a server with 48 CPU cores and a whole bunch of RAM, and you separate that out into 48 different operating systems running at the same time. But they're normally compatible with that underlying hardware, and often some of the code that's running on that operating system will, will be running directly on the underlying hardware. Whereas with emulation, it's all done in software, so there's this layer in between that and the hardware, and it means that the um, that the hardware that the software the hardware that's doing the emulation needs to be much more powerful. Um, than the, the hardware that's doing the virtualization because it has to recreate that entire hardware in, um, in software. But what virtualization is good for in the digital preservation world is bridging the gap between um, the departure of recently obsolete hardware and the arrival of um, hardware that, that's powerful enough to do that emulation completely in software. Um, and so I see there definitely being a role for both. I think over time everything will ha it would end up having to move to emulation, but in, the, in that interim gap where um, you're no longer running Windows Vista, but you have some software that runs on it and you need to keep it going, but you don't have a system that's powerful enough to emulate it yet. You run it in virtualization and you can still build the disk image and get it all in your workflows in time for when the emulator is available and you can um, put it back into that. Um, so another thing we need to do to enable the software curation is um, to make available documentation of all these different components so that um, we can do what I think is really necessary in this space, which is um, collaborate. Um, so to enable collaboration, we basically need to be able to have standard ways of talking to each other about the things that we're, um, we're dealing with. Uh, and we don't really have these for the most part. Um, so we need persistent identifiers and unique identifiers for software. We need them for the, the virtual hard drives so that we can exchange those hard drives or, and share them. If, you, if it doesn't make a lot of sense for everyone to go around and create standard uh, Windows 95 hard drive images with just Windows 95 shared on them. Um, or if we want, just want to be able to talk to each other about something being compatible with this disk Im image, um, we need to be able to identify those things. We also need to be able to identify the configured sets of hardware. So if you've got a Windows 95 era PC or a, a I don't know, Mac OS 7 era um, computer that's configured in, as an emulated environment, we need to be able to talk about what that means and identify it over time. And basically, we don't have most of that now. Um, the Internet Archive, uh, NIST, the uh, National Institute for Standards and Technology, I want to say, um, and Pronom at the uh, UK National Archives are all doing some good stuff around software documentation. But the other two, there's basically a gap at the moment. Um, so how does this actually work when you're doing it um, on a day-to-day -day basis? So with emulation, what you really need to do to begin with is configure your emulator or, or configure your emulated environment. So that's like you're building a computer from scratch. You take your, your memory, you take your CPU, you take your audio card and your um, video and your network and then your hard drive and you put them all together and connect them up. Um, with modern emulators, you can do this through a graphical interface and just click. You can say, I want a Pentium Aero PC with um, this kind of hardware, this audio card and so on. And then that can be saved as a configuration file just as metadata. And then you also um, attach a virtual hard drive, a virtual disk image, um, and then you can start installing your software on that. You can boot the machine and install your software. Um, and it generally requires specific tools for each emulator, um, and they can be a bit technically challenging. A lot of um, librarians and archivists would probably struggle with this step in the process. 
Um, and then when it comes to accessing these things, generally in libraries and archives at the moment, if, with the exclusion of the great work of the Internet Archive, um, they're using dedicated machines in reading rooms to provide access to these environments. Um, and they, they're normally quite restricted um, and you need to have special permission to access a lot of it, uh, often because it's technically challenging. And that's really too hard and it, it shouldn't be this hard. Um, so this is where the emulation as a service concept comes in. So emulation as a service is basically about providing remote access to emulated environments or virtualized environments via a web browser. It abstracts all those complicated configuration issues away from the end user and basically just provides a link you can click on and it'll boot in your web browser. Um, the, the implementation that uh, we're using at Yale uh, has a lot of really interesting features that are really quite, quite useful. Um, one of them is that, um, and this is pretty consistent with all emulation uh, approaches, but you can save, you can choose to save any changes that a user has made to the environment that they're using or not. So you could have all, uh, a, a pre-configured environment made available to an end user. They can do whatever they want in there. They can delete files. They can add things. Um, and then at the end of the session, it just gets lost, um, deliberately lost, so that next time someone logs in, it gets back to the same environment. Um, you can restrict interactivity where appropriate. So that means if you don't want someone downloading anything from it or you don't want anyone being able to print from it, you can do that. And that's really quite useful and quite powerful and something that came up in the discussion this morning. Um, because what it means is you can, you can get over some of the IP issues that come along with all of this. Um, and the emulations as a service software we're using at Yale allows you to quite quickly create custom environments. You can take a base environment, um, add something, install some software, and then provide a link to that to somebody else. And that, that's quite powerful. It gets at or gets towards the idea of virtual reading rooms. You can create a custom reading room for every patron quite quickly and quite easily. So the background for the, um, the, the things we're doing at Yale, basically this software is all produced by a team at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Um, They've done some really amazing work. I started working with them when I was in, working at the National Archives in New Zealand um, a few years back. Um, and I remember talking about the concept of this with um, one of the, the leads of the project over there while we are at New Zealand doing some brainstorming around it. I don't want to take too much responsibility for it, but um, it definitely was involved early in the early days. And now um, when I came to Yale, of course, I brought this along. And we actually have the first installation of the software outside of Germany. Um, and we've been testing it, we've been um, trying to figure out how we want to incorporate it into our workflows um, and providing requirements and, uh, and ongoing development um, collaboration. And we're planning to implement it into production in the next financial year. So why would you, you all be interested in this? Well, um, as we've mentioned, a lot of content can only be properly accessed using emulation tools. Um, it's technically specialised to do this emulation and can be quite challenging. Um, the old software can be a little difficult for modern users to understand. One of the things we're looking to do in a future iteration of this um, service is provide layers on top of the, the interface to, to point to how to use the software. So say you're loading up an old WordPerfect um, file. If you've ever tried um, the early versions of um, WordPerfect, they're mostly um, keyboard-only controls, and modern users just wouldn't get it. They, they wouldn't know which controls to use for starters. I certainly don't. I have to look it up every time I try and do it. Um, so if you can provide kind of a layer over the top with some pointers to click here to do that and so on, or you can even um, have little animations, um, that's the kind of thing that's enabled by this kind of approach. Um, the other great benefit, of course, is that users don't need to come into your reading room to access anything. They can access this stuff from anywhere in the world. Um, and, of course, you can maintain control over the content. The users can't copy data in or out of the environment unless you, you want to authorise them to do so. The one thing that's always going to be a problem with anything that's remotely accessed is the ability to take a screenshot or take a photograph, but that's probably acceptable for most people. Um, with this particular imp implementation that the, uh, the guys from Germany have put together, there is quite a strong separation between the environments, the installed disk image um, environments, and the, um, the objects that you might access via them and the emulators or the emulator configurations themselves. And what they've, they've got a few different ways of implementing it, including one where everything is local, or you can separate any of the bits out into, um, uh, to have some of them done locally and some of them done remotely. So you can outsource components, all of it, some of it, or none of it, um, as, you, as you wish. So you might have the disk images and the content locally and then the emulation provided remotely so that you don't have to deal with the more technical things. You can just keep the things that you want to keep in-house in-house. 
Um, you can create small um, derivative environments very easily. So you can click a button, uh, you can add, create, start with a base environment, add some files, click a button, and um, it creates what's called a derivative environment. And when it does that, it just saves the, the delta, the difference between that and the master environment, which is really good because um, the master environment comes with a disk image that usually has Windows or um, Mac OS installed on it, and it's usually quite big. So instead of having to keep that for every single new environment, you just keep the little difference. It saves a lot of space. And so then you can also uh, reuse the, the standard environments that you might, might have all these dependencies that are the same for all sorts of uh, other types of things that you want to access over time. The other thing that this um, particular implementation provides is the ability to cite environments. It gives you uh, a unique identifier for every single environment that you can then provide um, for citations. And it also provides a link that you can just email to people or add to your catalogs. Um, I blogged on the Library of Congress uh, digital preservation blog about this with some examples, um, which were actually from patrons that came to us and said, I want to access this, what can we do? Um, and yeah, yeah. Um, and you can have a look at that if you want some specific examples. Here's a diagram of the architecture. I can put you in contact with the team in Germany if you want to talk about the details. I don't have a lot to say about that aside from um, it's I'll get to a bit about the developers in, in a minute. Um, I'm going to try and go a bit quicker because I've taken up a lot of time. Um, from a practical perspective, you still need to, if you're going to implement this particular uh, approach, you still need to do that emulator configuration, but you can also leave that to, to the experts to do. Um, but what it requires is you, you configure the emulator locally and then you import that into the, the environment that you've configured into the service. And you can do that import, importation via um, a web, uh, web browser interface where um, you put the files into a folder, it looks for them, it um, then allows you to just configure it and label it and so on. And if you're a librarian or an archivist, the thing you're probably most likely to do is take one of these environments that's already in there, add some files to it, and then provide access to that to somebody else. And you can do that all via an, a web interface. You can also do the same thing with software. So, um, you could uh, add a CD-ROM to one of the environments that's already there, install the software, you can do the testing um, via your web browser, add some metadata about how it went, and then save that custom environment to be um, either then used to add some files to to provide access to, or what we've been doing um, is we've got all these CD-ROMs in our general collections that no one seems to be doing anything with, so we've been imaging them, and I've started making a lot of them available in the service. It's really easy to do. You just put the file into the into the um, right folder, then you can boot it up like this and install that software or add the link to the desktop and then um, provide that to somebody for it uh, to use. Um, you can also use that same uh, environment ingest interface to ingest entire disk images that you might have captured of, say, an author's hard drive. And from an end user perspective, um, it's really quite straightforward. If you have a finding aid or a catalog, you can take the, either the um, thumbnail or the, and the link, or just the link, and put it in there. Someone clicks on it and it loads. You can also just embed an environment into a web page. Um, so it's, it's right there in the middle of the web page. Now, if you're a developer, some of the interesting things about this implementation from Freiburg are that it, what it does is it basically provides an API for a whole bunch of different emulators. They've incorporated, for example, the same emulation software that's used by the Internet Archive, um, the JMES. That you, that's included in here. So are a bunch of other emulators. I think three Apple emulators, um, QMU plus VirtualBox, which provides a whole lot of um, really interesting uh, potential. With VirtualBox in there, you can put modern environments in there, which then provides you the ability to do weird kind of virtual reading room things that you might want to do. Um, and then you can incorporate that into your workflows. So if you want to put a, a emulation as one step in a, in, a, in a more complex workflow, you can do it just using this API, and it's a generic API. So you don't need to know the specifics of any of the particular emulators. Um, you can embed them into web pages and use them for online exhibits. You can um, cite them and provide URIs for everything. And one of the really cool things that they've been doing recently is collaborating with the Big Curator project. And what they're trying to do, and they've had a lot of success, uh, I believe, is make it so that once you basically one click, you image the thing, and it automatically figures out the configuration for the emulator. It um, configures it and then attaches the disk image that you've created so you've got it emulated, just like that. Um, so image, maybe even a CD-ROM, they've been doing that as well. And what it'll do is it'll look in the CD-ROM to see what kind of software is probably, what operating system is probably needed to access that CD-ROM, and picks the right environment that has that software already installed so that you can um, then just automatically 
boot it, and then all that's left is for the um, librarian or archivist to install the software, and then you've got a link to that environment for anyone to use. Um, I'm not going to demo right now. If there's any time at the end, I can, I can do that. But I will leave you with this um, slide, which is the link to the, um, the environment in, um, in Germany that you can go and try out yourself. The Wi-Fi here is a bit sketchy, so um, it's probably best if I don't try and demo it now. But uh, if anyone wants to have a look at it later, just come and find me. Thanks, Yun. So I'll turn to Oliver. That's perhaps a nice segue, but one of the differences, you know, we're all trying to achieve the same thing, one of the differences between Olive and Ewan's approach is that there is a, a separation between the location of the virtual machine image and the site at which it is launched and executed. It's demand paged and therefore if your um, internet connection isn't of data center quality you can still get there but I still wouldn't want to try it on the Wi-Fi in this hotel. Uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning that these slides are already on SlideShare um, on, on my account at, at CM Keith W, so feel free to grab the slides if you wish. The Olive project um, is driven out of the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon and has been funded for the last few years by IMLS and Sloan as a proof of concept, and that foundational work was recognised through an award towards the end of last year by the National Academies Board on Research Data and Information. We've also been working closely with Ithaca, so Deanna, I'm sure, might be able to join a conversation after this presentation. Um, Ithaca came in and provided a lot of guidance on some of the, the big questions that I'll pick up just at the end. Given time, I'm also going to, to whiz through these slides because all I'll do is read what it says on the screen, so grab them from the slide deck. Um, the interesting point here is the, the inspiration from YouTube that what we wanted to try and do was page on demand, but streaming a virtual machine is not as easy as streaming a YouTube video. And that has been at the, the absolute centre of the all of development work. The broad model there is very similar to what you've heard from Ewan already. Um, the host environment is represented on the, the boxes at the bottom of that structure. So. Um, you might, for example, be hosting all of this on a laptop running Linux. Um, Olive has built this caching service, which is on box three. Um, then inside that, virtualizing the host hardware using QEMU, as we've already heard. Then sitting on top of that is the guest environment. So, for example, it could be um, the, the hardware emulator hosting an old operating system, let's say Windows 3.1 or Mac OS 7 or similar. And then inside that, the old application, which might be an early version of WordPerfect for the sake of argument. And then inside that, the, um, the WordPerfect file or an Excel spreadsheet or some specific account in a computer game. So that is the, the, the broad conceptual structure um, illustrating that with some examples there. Um, some American game that I'm told was very popular in schools in the early 90s um, where you could plot the plague and how it would wipe us all out um, sitting inside an early version of Microsoft Windows. Um, let me just... Yeah, there are. So this is... Um, A YouTube um, illustration going to the Olive website where the virtual machines are available and there's a link towards the end of the slides to that page. Um, you'll also see the link there to this YouTube film showing the uh, way in which you can go in and start some software if you have the, the credentials to get in. In this case, Microsoft Office um, 6, um, opening it up and there we go. This will bring back memories for some of you, and some of you will be grateful that you didn't grow up in this era. Uh, it'll be a, a sentimental trip in a, a few seconds' time down the early PowerPoint um, demonstration slide. So here we go. 
we go. So this is what PowerPoint used to look like. Do we have trouble finding the uh, installation software? It's been, I guess, given the sort of university that Carnegie Mellon is, it's been quite in easy just to you know, tap anybody over the age of about 40 and ask them to open their desk drawer, and you'll find um, some of the disks. But, but that is a, a... So the horrors are our friends in this case. Abs absolutely. Uh, and we seem to have a culture on campus whenever a faculty member retires that their office contents are given to the library. And once you sort through the back, black bags, you can often find some of these old disks. Um, so this is, I think, the game that I mentioned. So here it's um, illustrating this. What I'll say, just whilst this is running through, one of the, the big challenges we face in this environment is the legal issue around software licensing. And that's why a lot of the software that we've been able to work with as proof of concept is not available outside the Olive environment because our lawyers are not as um, generous as Brewster's in steering us in the right direction. Um, we did commission a legal study which simply said, do not, and <laughs> then, then there were 300 pages. It was a bit like library rules for borrowers. Um, and here's um, a chance to see um, the early Mosaic browser able to execute an old website, but you, you'll see when we try and execute a contemporary website, um, in this case such as current CODA project, it doesn't look as nice as he would wish it to look. Um, and I think that's the, the end of that. Um, and I, you really don't want to watch that again, I've lost, I've lost the mouse. Right, so um, lots of, you know, although we've proved that it can happen, it is incredibly time consuming. We've been working with some of the current programs in PLOS computational biology, and these are taking weeks to work with because of the complexity of today's software. It's relatively straightforward to take an early 90s computer game and work with it. Uh, 2015 bit of software looking at genomic data is much more complex and therefore the, the technical expertise required to make that work is very demanding. Um, but you know, Satya has this wonderful conception of all of us being the reference library for the nation and the world. I think that he ought to talk to Brewster a bit more um, carefully about who's going to dominate the world in this space. Um, but there, there is this sense of you know, being able to look back in time, you know, what would Isaac Newton's model say about today's data? And that's why we are looking at the data that is being generated and the software that is being curated and made available through today's journals such as Software X and Plus Computational Biology. You can find more data about all of at the, the project website. There's a technical report. Um, in the School of Computer Science um, repository, which you can also access. Given that we now have five minutes between this moment in time and drinks, I'm going to stop talking <laughs> and um, invite any questions or comments. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>